So in this video, we're going to talk about the formation of tissue fluid. Now, we know tissue fluid bathes the cells of a tissue and it allows very useful molecules like glucose, amino acids and ions like sodium and chloride ions to enter cells. Now, waste products from cellular metabolism, things like carbon dioxide and urea, they will exit the cells and they will also be part of the tissue fluid that will drain back into the capillary network and exit the tissues. So the blood that enters the capillary network uh, comes from the arteriole. And we know an arteriole is a blood vessel that branches or splits off uh, an artery. So the blood inside the arteriole that will form the arteriole end of the capillary network is under relatively high blood pressure because we know it comes from the artery. Now the, uh, the blood inside the arterial end of the capillary network is going to have a high level of oxygen. So it's got high PPO2, but we know it's going to have a relatively low level of carbon dioxide. So it's going to have a low PPCO2 and it's under relatively high pressure. Now when the arterial splits into the capillary network, <clears throat> we know that the fluid component of the blood, the blood plasma, uh, it can seep across the wall of the capillaries and that forms tissue fluid. Now that will contain, as we said, uh, useful molecules like glucose, oxygen and mineral ions. Most of the plasma proteins will remain in the plasma of the blood. They can't actually get across the wall of the capillary, uh, as well as all the cells that we find in the blood will remain within the capillary itself. So things like erythrocytes, leukocytes, and thrombocytes. Now, when the tissue fluid uh, surrounds the cells, so it's a fluid that bathes all the cells of a tissue, the glucose and things like oxygen and mineral ions, etc., they can actually move into the cell and be utilized. We might put amino acids in there as well. So amino Acids. Now, from the, uh, the cells of the tissues, we know carbon dioxide and urea are released. <clears throat> They're waste products that are not needed by the cell. So the tissue fluid that bathes the, uh, the cells towards the venous end of the capillary network, that tissue fluid will actually go back into the capillaries, and we know they reform into a venule. So the venule end of the capillary network or the venous end of the capillary network will have blood that actually has a low PPO2 because the oxygen has been used by the cells in aerobic respiration, but it will have a relatively high PPCO2 because it contains the waste product carbon dioxide as hydrogen carbon ions. Now, we can actually highlight on here all the tissue fluid that bathes the cells. So the tissue fluid on the left hand side of the picture, this will have lots of oxygen within it. It will have glucose, amino acids that enter the cells. The tissue fluid on the right hand side of the picture will contain more uh, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and that's going to drain back into the um, venous end of the capillary. Now, about 90 percent of the tissue fluid goes back into the venous end of the capillary. About 10% of tissue fluid actually drains into lymphatic capillaries, which carry the tissue fluid through the lymphatic system. Now this tissue fluid will eventually end up back in the blood circulation um, through the thoracic duct that opens into the subclavian vein uh, up near the neck area of the body. <clears throat> So we also need to know the mechanism of how tissue fluid is formed. Now, if we look at this picture, we can start to annotate it. So on the left hand side is the arteriole. And we know here the blood is oxygenated and it's under high pressure because it comes from the artery, which contains high pressure, pressure blood from the left side of the heart. So here we can put high pressure. 
Now, when the capillary uh, splits off from the arteriole, we need to reference the arteriole end of the capillary. So this on the left hand side. So we're going to talk about this area here on the left. <clears throat> now, the blood uh, plasma creates what we call a high hydrostatic pressure because the fluid pushes against the inside wall of the arteriole end of the capillary. So this is about 30 in this picture millimeters of mercury. That's just a measure of pressure. So we call that high hydrostatic pressure. So high hydrostatic pressure. Now we know the blood plasma has dissolved solutes in it, things like amino acids, glucose, ions, and plasma proteins. Now we know if we've got dissolved solutes in a liquid, <clears throat> that does create a negative water potential. Therefore, that will create an osmotic pressure wanting to draw water into the capillary. However, the osmotic pressure is about 21 millimeters of mercury. So actually the hydrostatic pressure wanting to force fluid out of the arterial end of the capillary is greater than the osmotic pressure. And so we have a net filtration pressure that is a positive value and that forces the liquid part of the blood plasma um, that contains the glucose and the amino acids and the ions out <clears throat> of the arterial end of the capillary. So the hydrostatic pressure at the arterial end of the capillary is greater than the osmotic pressure that forces the fluid, the blood plasma out of this end <clears throat> and that forms our tissue fluid. So we get tissue fluid being formed here. Now, as we'll see in a minute, um, the cells can't escape the wall of the capillary. So they remain inside the, uh, the blood, inside the capillary, as the blood moves down the capillary vessel. Large plasma proteins can also not escape the capillary. So the large plasma proteins, as shown in green on this picture, they remain in the capillary vessel itself. So we can add in here, we can highlight some of these green plasma proteins, and you can see they stay within the capillary vessel itself. Now, once the tissue fluid is bathing the cells, we know the oxygen and the glucose and the amino acids and the mineral ions, we know they all enter the cells by either simple diffusion or <clears throat> facilitated diffusion, etc. Now we know carbon dioxide and urea or any other waste product of metabolism that is going to be released from the cells into, into the tissue fluid. And that tissue fluid is then going to drain back into the venous end of the capillary. But why does this take place? Well, as the blood moves down the capillary, we know lots of fluid is being lost from the blood. So the hydrostatic pressure that we've got over here on the left hand side, that diminishes as the blood passes down the capillary. So the hydrostatic pressure decreases as the blood passes down the capillary and fluid is lost. But the concentration of plasma proteins within the capillary itself actually increases and that's not because there's more plasma proteins they stay exactly the same number it's because the fluid has been lost so if you have the same number of plasma proteins in a smaller volume of fluid the concentration increases now that increased concentration of plasma proteins causes the water potential at the venous end of the capillary to become much more negative. So the water potential at the venous end is much more negative uh, compared to the arterial end. Now that creates a higher <clears throat> osmotic pressure, which is going to draw blood into, uh, sorry, going to draw tissue fluid into the venous end of the capillary. Because this time the osmotic pressure <clears throat> 
wanting to draw tissue fluid into the venous end of the capillary is greater than the hydrostatic pressure. So the net filtration pressure this time is a negative value. The osmotic pressure is greater than the hydrostatic pressure. It's a more negative water potential and tissue fluid drains back into the venous end. Now, when that tissue fluid <clears throat> has drained into uh, the capillary, we know the blood exits via the venule. Now, this blood is not going to have much oxygen in, so the PPO2, the partial pressure of oxygen is very low, and the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is much higher as hydrogen carbonate ions. Now, why do uh, larger plasma proteins and cells um, not leave the blood as part of tissue fluid? Well, if we look at the endothelial cells that make up the capillary wall, we know the capillary wall is one cell thick. But these capillary cells, these endothelial cells, they, um, they're a type of squamous epithelium, but they have little pores within the cells, and I'll highlight those in purple. And these are called fenestrations. Now, these little pores across the cell allow the movement of very small molecules or soluble molecules or ions, such as glucose, amino acids, ammonium, uh, sorry, um, salts, potassium ions, other mineral ions, etc., <clears throat> as well as water. So it's the fenestrations in the endothelial cells that um, allow or permit the movement of small soluble molecules and water out of the capillary to form tissue fluid. Now these fenestrations, we might want to think of the Latin fenestra or the French fenetra for window. And they're about 60 to 80 nanometers in diameter that span the endothelial <clears throat> cell. And as we said, they permit the movement of small mo uh, soluble molecules as well as water out of the arterial end of the capillary network. Now, if there's a buildup of tissue fluid around uh, the tissue to the body, we call this edema. Now, the spelling can be with an O at the front or with a lack of an O. So it's called edema. Um, we can see this uh, quite often it's caused by a lack of protein in the diet, so a form of malnutrition. Now, we'll do it on the next slide, the, the mechanism. But essentially, a lack of protein in the diet causes a lower concentration of plasma proteins in the blood. So it affects the osmotic pressure at the venous end of the capillary network. So it's not quite as significant. So the tissue fluid doesn't get drained back in <clears throat> to the venous end of the capillary as it should do. And it causes a build of tissue fluid around uh, certain tissues of the body, which produces this swelling appearance, uh, which can be seen here in these children called oedema. <clears throat> it's called quashiorco and it's due to malnutrition. Uh, we also see edema in uh, patients who might have lymphatic blockages or uh, different forms of kidney damage. <clears throat> and this is where it's progressed uh, quite an extensive uh, amount and it causes build of tissue fluid and the swelling that you can see here in the picture in this person's leg, lower leg and, and foot. Now, the mechanism for the buildup of tissue fluid or edema is because, like we said, um, malnutrition, lack of plasma proteins in the diet predominantly. <clears throat> now, if we think about this, on the left hand side, the arterial end of the capillary network, we know there's a high hydrostatic pressure, um, which is greater than the osmotic pressure. So we know the, the fluid part of the blood, the blood plasma can leave via the fenestrations with soluble molecules like glucose and ions, etc. However, if there's fewer plasma proteins within the bloodstream, so these green plasma proteins here, if there's less of these because of a lack of protein in the diet, then the water potential at the venous end of the capillary, even though it is negative still, 
it's less negative than it would have been previously where there was more protein in the diet. So if you take away plasma proteins in the blood, the uh, water potential of the venous end of the capillary is less negative or it's a higher value. And that means the tissue fluid is much less likely to be drawn back in to the venous end of the capillary because the osmotic pressure is not as uh, significant. Now this tissue fluid, because it's not being drained back into the venous end, it does accumulate around the cells and that can give rise to this swelling that we see uh, as oedema. 